let's go ahead and get started. Today we are delighted to have Dr. Kunji Zhao um, to talk with us about complex event processing, a paradigm for fast data management. Purely coincidentally, this is also a real-time analytics talk uh, to follow the excellent talk given by the eBay folks last month, uh, which many of you attended. And it turns out that next month's talk from Microsoft is also going to be on analytics, so hopefully you all can attend as well. Um, anyway, Dr. Kunji Zhao is a software engineer currently at Apple. He received his PhD in computer science from USC. Uh, his research interests are in the area for linked data, scalable data management, uh, and distributed computing systems. His articles have appeared in conferences, in, including International Semantic Web Conference, IEEE Big Data Conference. He is the first place co-winner in the IEEE International Scalable Computing Challenge in 2012. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Quan Ji and, uh, so that he can share with us his talk. Uh, Quan Ji, uh, please go ahead. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming, and uh, thanks for Thanks uh, to Minibo to offering these opportunities. Um, so uh, today I will present uh, company unit processing as a paradigm for fast data management. So um, Sita has already wait. Okay. So Sita has already made the introduction. Introduction. So. Um, so I just want to emphasize that uh, the work I present today is uh, part of my uh, work uh, I uh, did uh, back in University of Southern California as, uh, as part of uh, my PhD study. Uh, so there are couple, uh, quite a few slides to cover, so I probably will uh, skip some details. So, um, so I will talk about uh, fast data management. So firstly, I will introduce the background and the motivating applications, and then I, I will try to gener generalize um, what is fast data, uh, the introducing the three-way dimension uh, interpretation. And, and then I will uh, describe the three, uh, three approaches uh, to address um, the three-way dimensions of fast data uh, respectively. And finally, I will conclude the talk. So uh, data management, um, we all know it's about uh, data storage and uh, data access. And there are two common uh, design patterns, uh, including database, uh, which essentially is uh, performing ad hoc queries uh, over durable data storage. Uh, we also have a stream processing, which is in, in the contrast is uh, streaming in-flight data through uh, standing queries uh, uh, for the query evaluation. So the so real-world applications uh, is driving uh, the involvement of uh, these uh, data management systems. Uh, for example, uh, today we have uh, the following applications like in e-commerce domain, we have a run online retail, so which uh, basically is uh, process uh, very high volumes of uh, web orders uh, in real time uh, to detect like uh, uh, SLA violations to trigger inventory review operations. Uh, all, all this is uh, required to be completed in, in fast with fast response. Also, in social media, we have a real real time advertising is uh, processing the digital advertisements and uh, matching the subscription patterns in real time. Also, we have uh, applications in smart grid domain, which um, like uh, the dynamic demand response, which leverage, leverage the uh, real-time meter, meter measurements, the weather forecasts, EV charging status, and all combine all this kind of data to predict the power node and detect uh, the demand curtailment uh, in uh, in real time. So um, to summarize these applications, what's in common is that they all have a high rate data input and they, they all have a real time processing requirements. So basically they want to re uh, take actions uh, in, uh, in faster response. Also, uh, 
also, this application is to have a very diverse uh, data semantics. Uh, also, it has uh, diverse uh, users. So, uh, for example, in, in online retail, it's a web orders we may be associated with different categories of uh, product, right? And uh, also in smart grid, we have uh, uh, many different types of users which have a, have a different different domain knowledge. They all want to define their applications um, for, for the part load and the demand criteria opportunities, but they don't have this, the same view of the domain. Um, finally, um, if we uh, take a look over the data in, present in these applications, we, we can see they all have, have very dynamic data life cycles. So basically, uh, in most cases, we don't want to persist uh, the data observed uh, all the time. So basically, this data um, will be quickly uh, lost of their values. So um, to, generalize, to generalize, so we uh, basically we have the concept of uh, fast data. So we all know, we all know the big data it has uh, three three dimensions like volume, variety, and uh, velocity. So we will leverage the same concept and apply it to fast data. So fast data is essentially big data which uh, emphasizes more on the data velocity. So the main difference between big data and fast data is that the data is arriving uh, in high velocity and also it need to be it to be processed uh, at high high rate, high throughput and uh, low latency. So uh, let's re review um, what the existing data measurements fall into these three three way dimensions. So uh, obviously the database is more a volume centric, right? It uh, basically processes static data with synthetic uh, variance and uh, performs ad hoc queries uh, over the persistent volumes. And the stream processing is more velocity centric. It processes real-time data, we, and in most of the existing systems, they only care about the syntactic, syntactical variance of the, of the data, and using, using the relational uh, data schema. Um, it processes uh, continuous queries uh, on the fly, and under the semantic web, um, you, so it's, uh, it's similar to databases that it, it also processes uh, static data. Of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, actually it's a graph data represented uh, in RDF. Uh, and it also... Uh, oh. Kunji, there's a question here. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, the question, the question is, what makes database data static? So, uh, it's, it's probably not a strictly static. It's a re so basically, re so it's a basically it's slow changing data, right? So, so, so uh, it's it's a relative with the stream processing. It's uh, it's not handling the data that like had uh, millions of events uh, per second. As you know, so I, so just to give a concrete example, uh, and the questioner can follow up if uh, if you would like, is you know if I update my Facebook um, status mm -hmm. um, and that gets persisted by Facebook in its database, is that considered static data or is that considered dynamic data from your perspective? So uh, in that case, it's considered static data because um, in later on we may query that, that data, right? We, we query that data in batch. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're okay. not processing that, that kind of data, I mean, on the fly, so... So, from so any, any data that persisted from your perspective is considered yeah. static. Any data right. that may not be persisted is not static. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, um, so the difference between the semantic web and database is that uh, semantic web incorporates the semantic variance uh, in the data model and in, in the queries. Mm. So uh, here, uh, the company you want to process is actually the variance of uh, stream processing. 
So typical, the traditional stream processing systems like uh, IBM InfraSphere and uh, other systems, they usually adopt uh, like uh, workflow uh, paradigm uh, using like a box and arrows specify a workflow of uh, processing. However, company even processing uh, it uh, adopt a SQL like a query language. So in uh, so it allows to so it provides us explicit temporal patterns like a sequence of queries and uh, windows uh, in the query language. So um, so since uh, company one processing is designed to deal with uh, uh, high rate uh, high rate uh, high rate events, so it's quite straightforward to think about uh, applying CEP for fast data management. So, however, we need to discover what the gaps uh, between C existing CEP systems uh, and uh, the fast data ma management requirement. So, firstly, uh, CEP system needed to be, uh, be aware of uh, semantic uh, data, data variety. Uh, secondly, uh, we want to ap apply ad hoc queries over the dynamic data volume. So traditional CP systems only support online queries. So however, sometimes we, uh, actually we will show some examples later, we also want to apply ad hoc queries over data streams. And uh, finally, we, uh, we want CP system to, to be able to uh, perform seamless queries across both uh, static uh, history data and the real-time data. So uh, to summarize um, the, the objective is that we actually want to achieve context as well and the dynamic and the temporary contiguous management of clusters <laughs> along the three way dimensions. So we, pro we will discuss uh, three approaches to address um, these three way dimensions uh, respectively. So, in particular, we will pro pro we propose a semantic company event processing to deal with uh, data variety. And we uh, introduce a stateful complex event processing to deal with uh, uh, ad hoc queries over the transient uh, data streams. And we also discussed uh, a resilient company event processing to deal with uh, queries across uh, you can see of course database and uh, the data streams. So uh, firstly the semantic company you want to process them. So first we, we, we show an example in the demand, demand response application in the smart grid domain. So to see why do we need to incorporate uh, data semantics in, in CEP. So for example assume, assuming uh, on uh, on a university campus, um, we uh, we have uh, have sensors to measure the HVAC unit, and the data in like have have the schema like a sensor ID has a flow rate uh, and uh, time stamp, and uh, and the users want to define a query to re over this data stream uh, to report uh, when the inbound airflow of uh, HVAC unit in an office room of a certain department exists a certain threshold. So we can see that like uh, the concept of office and uh, the department, this kind of concept is, uh, does not represent in the data schema uh, uh, explicitly. It's actually it's just part of uh, domain knowledge, right? And also you can see um, this domain knowledge subject to change. So so probably you have a, have a new role become an office role. But uh, however, we, we want to sh hide this underlying domain complexities from the user queries. Uh, so we don't want to, um, so we don't expect the user to know the underlying details of the infrastructure, which, for example, which sensor is uh, uh, installed uh, office and uh, which role has become an office. Uh, and so on, I, I, we don't want the queries uh, needed to change uh, even though the underlying the main infrastructure was changed. Um, also, we want to mitigate the impact uh, if, 
on the query performance. So, uh, our, so um, let's see. In this figure, the top on the top it shows uh, what the traditional CPU do. So it's basically um, uh, allows to specify the relational patterns over directly over the over the data schema, and. The, to achieve a semantic CPU, we adopt a model-based approach. So, so on top of uh, on top of uh, raw data streams, uh, we also have have uh, we introduced the semantic events and the uh, domain models. Of course, these are both represented uh, using uh, using semantic web. And the and the user queries are are specified and processed. Uh, over these uh, middle tier uh, models. So here is uh, um, some uh, formal example of uh, the semantic event and event model. So the, uh, in traditional CP systems, um, of course, we have different representations of the raw events. It can be XML, can be a Java object, and so on. But uh, essentially, they can all be abstracted as a as uh, basically uh, relational tuples, like uh, no attribute and name and value pairs. And the way you reach this uh, raw event uh, with, with uh, domain knowledge. Mm, so basically we link the raw event tuple uh, from the fig figure we can see, we basically link this uh, raw event tuple with uh, predefined domain knowledge, domain ontologies. And uh, here is a, is a query structure with that we have developed for this kind of a model. So um, it basically have, uh, firstly have three declaration clauses to declare the ontology name spaces, uh, the input and the output definition. And uh, more importantly, in the where clause, which we have uh, two segments, qualifi qualification clause, which contains um, the semantic subquery and the CEP subquery. Um, so the CEP subquery is actually is simply the native CEP query constraints over raw events. So it uh, has a non-correlation operator like a filter, non-temporal correlation operator join, and a temporal correlation operator like a sequence and, uh, and a windows. And the semantic subquery uh, it's, uh, it's actually uh, just uh, Sparkle proper Sparkle queries uh, over the uh, events and their linked uh, domain ontologies. So here is a here is the example query uh, specification for uh, uh, for the example we uh, described earlier. So basically, this query um, is to uh, firstly, it uh, has a semantic subquery to qualify uh, the events. That's, so the events must to be from from an office room here, and also must be to belong a e department. And uh, finally, we have a CP subquery to uh, qualify the attributes of the raw events. When you a question? Mm -hmm. uh, when do the Domain-specific uh, annotations uh, get added to the raw event. Is that done in the post-processing step, or is that done as the events are uh, ingested into the system? So uh, it's done at the runtime uh, when the events was injected to the system. Uh, so, so I didn't uh, uh, talk about the details here. So what we are doing is that, so basically we have, uh, uh, you can see there's a mapping here, right? So a raw event, after we uh, received, uh, observed a raw event, we basically map. We have a mapping file to map this uh, different field to to uh, resource uh, in the ontology. For so since ID, it map to map to here, and the flow read uh, map to this semantic event have uh, airflow attribute. So uh, after we, basically we, uh, if we look at this figure here, actually, the first step is the semantic allocation, right? When we observe events, 
we then generate a semantic event uh, based on mappings. And then, yeah, and then, uh, then we will uh, process the semantic subquery. And then we'll process the CEP subquery. Uh, this, uh, this is the processing pipeline. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, so, so there are some problems with this kind, this approach because uh, we all know that uh, semantic queries are very, uh, uh, very expensive. Um, so it usually takes uh, hundred, several hundred uh, milliseconds to just process one query. So, so uh, we uh, so basically we need to do some optimization to improve the throughput of, of the query evaluation. So what we did we do is uh, from two aspects. Firstly, the static semantics processing. So the key intuition is uh, to reduce um, the semantic subquery complexities by uh, basically perform uh, the reasoning and uh, semantic reasoning and then matching uh, at a compile time. Um, however, not all the data semantics can be processed uh, at a compile time. Uh, that is because um, we have the semantic, semantic event properties which is generated at a runtime uh, for example, by the annotation. So, so of course, the basic approach is that we evaluate this query upon the arrival of every new event. Um, so, as you can see later, the, uh, actually, the, the, if adopting this baseline approach, the throughput is very low. So, we have, uh, have we proposed two optimizations. One is the event buffering. So, um, so basically, uh, we so we can evaluate the queries over a batch of uh, events collectively uh, to to decrease the average uh, static overhead of semantic queries. And also, we propose um, to cache the query results because um, many of the events we share the query evaluation results. So we don't need to um, evaluate this um, this event against the query every time every time. So um, here's some details about uh, query caching. So why we can when we can uh, look up the results from the ca from the cache. Um, so in in this example here, so we can see. Uh, for events, right? If they have, for for the events from the scene, or in this simple example, from the scene sensor, right? Um, they must share the same uh, query results. If the queries uh, you're trying to evaluate whether uh, uh, whether this uh, event, where where that this event come from, right? Uh, whether it's from office or e department, so we don't need to evaluate the events. This kind of uh, uh, Semantic, uh, sem semantic query pass every time for this for the for the event from the same sensors. So here's some uh, experiment results to compare the uh, the performance of the baseline approach and the and the optimizer approach. So we can see the semantic filtering and it's obviously the bottleneck of the online query evaluation. And uh, the baseline approach uh, from the figure B, we can see uh, the baseline approach uh, can really process 80 events per second, is, which is very low because uh, just in, in, for example, in USC campus, we, uh, we have actually, we have a thousand of events per second uh, observed, uh, collected from, from just from one building. So, um, so combined with the event buffering and uh, query cache um, process, we can achieve uh, several thousand events per second. Okay. Uh, so next uh, is a state state for complex event processing. So here's the application scenario. 
So, for example, in online retail, we of course we need a continuous online queries. So, for example, we want to report uh, four orders uh, that are successfully uh, forwarded within an hour, following a sequence of operations. So, in that way, we can report uh, report once uh, orders was fulfilled. However, we also in many scenarios we also want to perform ad hoc queries over the data streams. For example, we want the managers may want to report the total number of orders that are currently pending on a certain step, like delivery. So this query can be uh, queried at any time. So it's it's not like an online query that is uh, like uh, standing there. It's uh, so, um, so ob the objective of a stateful company event processing is uh, to uh, support both online and on-demand queries uh, over data streams. So without the necessity to uh, persist all the data in the durable storage. So, so uh, our approach is, uh, is a hierarchical query paradigm. So we manage the dynamic uh, online query states and uh, process the online queries over the query online, online query states. Um, so in the in the online retail example, the online query is uh, reporting the completed order uh, continuously. Uh, so we persist the query states. It's uh, basically it's persist the incomplete. Uh, in, in companies orders what their, their processing sequence and on demand queries uh, for example if we want to report the total number of orders that in currently in a certain state date it simply can be applied over the intermediate states of uh, the previous online queries so um, so this uh, this query paradigm is like a uh, it's like a query over query scheme. So we want to uh, we want to explore the relationships between queries and the properties of the queries. So we build up our approach uh, upon a formal uh, event and a query algebra. So in this algebra, um, we discuss uh, event event uh, properties and operations, and uh, the query uh, query properties and uh, their relationships. Mm. So uh, I'll probably just skip uh, some details here. So firstly, we uh, generalize events mm, as a graph uh, representation, and uh, we discuss. So the, the event string is essentially a temporary ordered event set, and we have uh, the notion of a substring, child string, and so on. And the operations over event set is uh, we have the trace operator is basically is extract the uh, event attributes and uh, we have a query operator is basically is trying to quantify the event you events uh, using you use a graph patterns uh, for the for the queries um, we define uh, we define what's the match of the query and what what's the violation of uh, of a event query. Um, here we have the notion of uh, uh, of three types of matches, including the undeveloped undeveloped match, basically at a certain point of time, right? Um, so certain pattern, cert certain event pattern has a completely matched. So this pattern is, is a developed match. And the sum of the match is partially matched. So, um, so, so this developing match uh, can eventually become a developer match, but it can also um, um, it it's all re um, depends on what the future events uh, will, will, will arrive. So it can also be kind of violation. So uh, the query states um, is essentially the event of interest at a certain point of time in order to match the target query. Uh, 
So for, for the example here, so uh, to have that, um, have that pattern, um, at, at time t, we basically only have two events observed. And these two events can potentially develop to a uh, match of the query. So we have to remember, remember this, uh, this, this set of uh, partial matches. And so uh, we basically define, define this set of uh, patterns, uh, that this set of uh, partial matches as uh, query states. One here question. Mm -hmm. How big can the match window be? Oh, so, so the match window, it uh, really depends on how the users want, want it to be, right? So, of course, it's for, actually, actually, I will discuss later if uh, the, the time window is very big, so you will expect a lot of uh, query states reside stored in, in the memory, right? So is is the uh, is the uh, is the uh, window measured in time in units of time or is it measured yeah. in the number it's, of events? Uh, so it, uh, yeah, so the the windows can be in both uh, the length and the in time. So okay, and uh, just uh, you may be coming to this, but is the matching process within the window? Uh, you know, what is the complexity of that? Is that uh, is that uh, exponential? Is that linear? I mean, uh, you know, I'm obviously you've got some interesting optimizations there. Maybe you're coming to it. Mm. So, um, so I think it's a linear uh, complexity. If, uh, because you're essentially doing, the, uh, are you trying to do subgraph matches in the in the in the window? Uh, yes. Okay. Actually, it's, uh, you perform the, the query evaluation before before this event came came into this window, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So um. So we also discussed the uh, uh, relations of the queries, so that we because we want to develop uh, develop a, a query paradigm that uh, is uh, like a query uh, over a query. So, um, so basically we um, so we basically study the query subsumption uh, relationships, and uh, the implication here is that uh, an on-demand query can be evaluated over the states of the super queries, uh, which um, govern the data of interests. So, uh, in this way that we, to evaluate on-demand query, we don't need to perform the queries over all the events that we have observed. So, we only need to persist uh, the states of its uh, super queries. So, uh, actually, this is, uh, this is a problem that uh, Sreda just uh, mentioned. So there are some challenges to to implement this kind of uh, uh, query paradigm. So because we need probably need to handle very large uh, intermediate query states. So when when we have a very long running time windows, we have a large numbers of uh, users, uh, user queries, and uh, high high event rate. So uh, we we prototyped a. Uh, uh, architecture which leverages uh, uh, Stone, which uh, is a distributed uh, event processing framework, uh, to leverage its uh, stream partition and query distribution uh, capability. So uh, on the left side of the figure, it's uh, actually the topology is uh, quite simple. So we have a data spout is basically the uh, source uh, event stream. And the query spot is uh, is a win where from where the users uh, can submit queries, and and the, and the process board is uh, basically our our query engine, and it's collected to the data spot using field uh, grouping and create a query spot uh, with uh, all all grouping. So um, so if uh, if you are familiar with the stone that. So you will know that based on the fields grouping, uh, 
and store can uh, partition the data streams uh, for distributed processing. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll probably give the details of uh, the architecture here. Uh, Okay, um, so uh, the next topic is uh, resilient complex event processing, which uh, basically is uh, deal with uh, um, data velocities, if uh, we recall. So we have uh, static data reside in database. We also have uh, uh, dynamic data uh, on, uh, on, the on the data streams. So in some scenarios, we want to perform seamless queries across the boundaries of uh, these two, um, two types of uh, data sources. So, um, so basically our approach um, is, uh, is simply, uh, so data stream we so first, the focus the data stream uh, when it passes through the real-time query agent, and uh, uh, some of the events also um, are persisted in the event store, and uh, the, and then we int uh, we have integrated query plans uh, to integrate the query results uh, from from the different sources. So so the, the architecture seems uh, very straightforward, um, but uh, we still have to handle some some special uh, scenarios here. So uh, this is just an uh, uh, extended structure of the, pre the SCP query model uh, to support this kind of uh, seamless queries across stream boundaries. So basically we have a new cloud called a within, which uh, basically specify a time range. So, so we need to notice that, note that the time range the data in this time range may may stored in in a database. It may come uh, from the data stream in the future. So um, so we need to consider the following three uh, uh, stream configurations, right? Um, firstly, the I ideally. Uh, the data either be either, can either be the data archives or on the data stream is the case uh, the first case. However, in in some configuration, probably the data is uh, in the database and uh, also it, because of uh, latency, it also connects uh, from the stream. And uh, the the third case is that is that um, the there are some data probably in the flight. They are either not observed by the database or observed by the by the stream. So we we need to uh, we need to pr we propose this uh, integrated query plans uh, to taking care of uh, uh, these uh, scenarios. So just take an example here in the uh, the query query plan B. If we have a negative gaps. Between between this data, we basically what we can do is uh, we can uh, in the database query, we in the archive query, we basically uh, will skip um, skip the uh, queries that are present uh, on the stream. Um, so we'll, uh, so th th the problem here is that we when we perform a CP query um, across um, across the data database and the stream, we need to consider that. Uh, for example, the time windows, right? It may be across uh, the boundaries of of this uh, of of the data. Um, so um, so um, our approach, of course, is first to, uh, query the data archives and then uh, query the data streams, and finally we uh, we integrate the results. So uh, we proposed, actually experimented two approaches to uh, process the uh, temporal queries uh, over data archives. One is a naive, naive event replay. What we do is uh, materialize events from the database and uh, stream in the history data 
uh, through the CEP engine. And another approach is that we can rewrite uh, the CEP queries uh, into database queries and perform the query on batch uh, over the database. And a hybrid approach is uh, combine this rewriting and replay because we observed that different types of constraints have uh, different uh, performance over strings and uh, database. Uh, in part particular, uh, non-correlation constraints uh, actually can be uh, performed in batch uh, in database at very high performance. But uh, for correlation const constraints, um, uh, we, we can see the stream processing has a much, much better performance. So here is a, a experiment evaluation of the performance of uh, under, under the field fast scenario. So, so we from here uh, on, on the right side. The figure shows the throughput of the of the queries. Uh, we can see if uh, we have the naive replay, uh, we have a very low um, throughput. Um, I so that, that's because um, so as I said, that, that's because. Um, you can see the uh, uh, many uh, long correlation uh, constraints. Uh, when you per perform uh, this constraints, constraints over string, you basically um, you basically need to, need to materialize um, all the history data uh, and uh, process um, process over the CP. However, if you use a hybrid approach, you basically can process this kind of a constraints uh, in batch. Uh, okay. Um, anyway, um, so so here I conclude talks. Um, so in this talk, we talk about the semantic uh, company when the processing to address the data variety are present in the fast data management. So we discussed the semantically uh, enriched uh, CEP event and the query models, and uh, di uh, discussed uh, uh, semantic query processing techniques uh, over uh, over data streams. Also, uh, we discussed the stateful event processing to deal with uh, uh, ad hoc queries over over the dynamic. Uh, Dynamic stream volumes. So we uh, we introduced the formal event and query algebra, uh, which, uh, which defines uh, what's the query states, uh, what's the query subsumption relations, and uh, uh, based on this uh, query algebra, we build a hierarchical uh, online and on-demand query paradigm and uh, prototype the distributed uh, processing architecture. And finally, to deal with the uh, data with a different velocity, we yeah, basically perform the queries across across data archive and the data streams. Uh, we analyze the event stream configurations, and uh, we uh, actually discuss the archive query techniques and uh, integrate query plays. I think for more details, um, I, uh, if you're interested, you may refer uh, to some of, some of my papers and uh, dissertation uh, because it's uh, it's uh, some work I did uh, two years back, so it uh, may be a little bit fuzzy here. So, so, uh, um, so if I uh, have any questions, uh, I think I can still have some time to answer. Folks, uh, so uh, Quinji, thanks for your talk. Uh, <clears throat> folks, while you guys uh, think of a few questions, there are a few questions that have already come in. Let me go ahead and start that and, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, welcome any uh, other insights and questions as well. So, uh, Quinji, can you put up that slide that has the gap 
uh, you know, how you handle the, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, the, uh, okay. all right, yes. So I, I guess the, the, the um, can you again explain um, what is the, 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 the gap comes because the data might either be in the stream or, or the archive or both, correct? Uh, yes. So if you, uh, yeah, if you have a setup like uh, you have a data coming in, right? So this data stream is monitored by a C, uh, by a stream processing engine, by a CEP engine, and also the data is of, actually if you look at it here, also forked uh, to go to the uh, uh, data store, right? So so you can see you. Um, there can possibly be a, so some of the data can probably still, it can, when it has a, um, actually a positive gap. So some of the data is a, uh, basically it's not observed by the real-time engine yet. And it's also not yet persisted uh, in the data store. So and in that scenario, if we will perform that query, um, so it's, Potentially, actually, you there are some some data that you are missing. Correct. Okay. 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 So and that's a function of the window, right? Because at some point, when the query gets asked in a few more seconds, then that data will in fact be in either in either uh, yeah. repository, right? Yeah. So uh, currently, the gap is uh, actually in our experiment is uh, configure is a configurable parameter, and I think in real-world application, it uh, should not be uh, configurable. It, it should, it's not a fixed value. Um, second question that has come in is, um, why do you need the concept of the fail fast and in that window? I mean, what, what, what does that do for you? Okay, so, uh, so fail fast is uh, just a scenario that, uh, mm, that shows uh, why we need to query, uh, perform queries across the stream boundaries. So fill fast is basically, so, um, so for example, your CP system, um, sometimes it's uh, 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 filled uh, due to some, um, like a software or hardware failures, right? And then uh, after, some, after some time, the, the stream process engine is coming up However, so in in this time, the fa in this failure time, so you basically uh, there are some patterns. The stream process engine, the real time process engine, failed to detect, right? Because at that time your system is shut down. So, so in that scenario, you you want to perform the same query uh, uh, over the database and the real-time stream, right? Okay. Yeah, so the fail fast is essentially just a scenario that uh, um, is the application scenario that we need to perform the queries across uh, database and uh, data streams. Okay, okay. <clears throat> um, let's see, another question has come in. Um, you know, you mentioned in your in your uh, slide that uh, <clears throat> you know using the model, you guys uh, from the baseline, you were able to go from 80 queries a second to about 3,000 queries a second, uh, or 3,000 events per second. Um, <clears throat> where do you see uh, this kind of work being applied? Let's say in a commercial environment where the events might be of the order of tens of thousands of events per, uh, per second. Uh, how would you see your model being applied there? Um, so, uh, so our approach is, uh, I think, I think there's still space um, for this optimization. Uh, just uh, if you uh, know well uh, about the data itself, right? Um, um, so basically. So uh, actually, I I think I did some did talk about the, the static um, semantic processing. So um, actually, to in 
improve this performance additionally to handle that, that kind of uh, uh, even more like uh, millions of events um, per second. This handle this kind of throughput. What we can do uh, is actually completely uh, we uh, eliminate eliminate the semantic uh, processing at a runtime. Um, if we know the data, we can. Um, um, basically, we can generate some kind of uh, mapping mapping files uh, uh, using previous uh, using um, using compile time uh, reasoning, and then uh, we at the runtime we will not we will not actually perform any semantic uh, matching, just uh, just uh, look up the match from uh, from the lookup files, but the Precondition is that you you have to know uh, know the data, so know the range of the uh, data the attribute values, and they, so that you can uh, pre-compute uh, this uh, this kind of a query results at uh, compile time. Uh, I think in that way, I think potentially it can handle. I think uh, because uh, in that way, it's basically just like a CP traditional CP queries, right? Uh, I think it uh, can uh, the traditional CP systems can handle actually several uh, um, several hundred thousand of events per second, and in that case, I think uh, our system can also uh, with uh, with a compile time semantic processing we can also handle that much of uh, throughput. So, so it is, it is, um, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So the assumption, so the experiment that did here is, is that we we assume that we don't know what's the uh, basically the attribute value, uh, the range can be. But if we know that, uh, actually we can, as I said, we can remove we can move the semantic processing completely uh, at compile time. So to further increase this um, performance. So this this question might be related to this one, um, the one you just answered. Uh, is uh, I don't know the storm architecture. So the question is, uh, is the process semantic evaluation process fundamentally parallelizable? That is, is it amenable to sort of a map reduce architecture? So can you repeat the question again? Um, yeah, so um, since since um, the semantic processing is what's um, you know uh, expensive, the questioner yeah. is asking is is the semantic processing fundamentally parallelizable? That is, can you distribute it across multiple machines as a way of uh, increasing the throughput? Okay, uh, I think there are a couple of researchers uh, working on parallelizing uh, Sparkle queries, um, but uh, in our case, uh, in our architecture, we actually we a lot of dealing with um, parallelizing uh, semantic subqueries, semantic queries. Um, uh, by using Stone here, what what we what we do is uh, we basically is uh, trying to partition. Uh, it's not we are not partitioning the queries or the semantic queries or something. We are partitioning the data streams uh, uh, by using Stone. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I think. Um, um, par parallelize um, the semantic queries. Uh, I think is definitely another um, um, approach. I, I mean, approach to improve the performance of our system. Uh, but uh, it's um, not a focus of what is work. Are you aware of any citations that talk about uh, Sparkle uh, parallelization? If so, that might be useful to. Um I'll talk to you offline for that and get the, get the Yeah, sure, sure. I, I think actually someone in our group, uh, Ernie, has uh, did some work, also did some work on this. So. Uh, folks, uh, some of you might need to leave, um, but if, are there any other questions? If so, um, you know, let's um, ask them. If not, uh, I think uh, uh, Kwonju has also given his email address. Uh, you can send him questions directly or else uh, route them through me. Uh, let's see, any other questions? I see none, so I think, uh, Kwonju, you have actually achieved the, uh, the first, which mm -hmm. is we're actually uh, concluding the seminar on time. Okay. <laughs> you know, and, so uh, before we get before we wrap up a, a couple things, 
folks, please do fill out the seminar um, feedback. Uh, I welcome your feedback on topics uh, that we should have, uh, how we can improve seminar offering, et cetera, et cetera. So would welcome that. Also with suggestions for speakers, if you have any. Uh, many of you are from companies today. If you if you intend to, uh, you know, would like to give a talk about what you guys are doing, please share that with us as well. Uh, let's see. So I guess, uh, Kwanji, you know, as you've done in the past webinars, uh, you know, uh, we're all from different locations, including uh, other parts of the world. So I guess I'm going to unmute everybody right now, and please, uh, folks who are self-muted, please unmute yourselves, and we'll give Kwanji a warm round of applause in the, by in the form of a virtual clap. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and do that right now. And um, um, uh, thanks, Kwanji, uh, okay. for your excellent talk. And uh, folks, as we discussed, that the slides will be online shortly. The recording will be online in about an hour. So feel free to pass it on to folks that might be interested and uh, you know share any ideas we have. Thanks again, Kwanji. Thanks, uh, all of you, for participating. We'll see you guys on March 23rd, I believe, for the next webinar uh, from Microsoft. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, all. Bye.